podcast and recording of Consuming Fire Ministries International Church, where I am the founder, pastor, and servant leader, Apostle Jarvis Hines. I want to welcome all of you to another live virtual recording of Consuming Fire Ministries International Church uh, Ministries broadcast. We thank all of you for joining us this morning. We recognize and realize you could have joined any other service, but you decided to join us this morning. And we are so grateful and elated to have you once again to join us for our live virtual service. I want to give a shout out, first of all, to our Consuming Fire Ministries International Church family. Know that I love you to our Las Vegas family as well as our California family. We thank God for you. We love you. And we always say, truly, this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. But we believe here at Consuming Fire Ministries International Church, we believe that the fire of God purifies and that the spirit and the word of God makes one alive. So I'm grateful for you joining us and to all of our covenant partners and to our family and friends who constantly watch us and support us, whether we're virtual on our live or whether we're on our via conference call. We thank you for joining us this morning. We are excited to go forth with the word of the Lord because there is a word from the Lord. Glory be to God. I'm excited about what God is doing and what he shall continue to do. And I just want to give a shout out once again. October is the month of breast cancer month. Those who have survived, I want to give a shout out to you. We're grateful and we're thankful for those of you who have survived and those of you who may be going through with it right now. We continue to pray for divine healing for you in the name of Jesus. We continue to ask God to heal your body as you go through your radiation, go through your chemotherapy. We believe that God is Jehovah Rapha. He is the Lord that is able to heal. Yes, Lord. Amen. We believe in healing. We are a healing and a deliverance ministry. Yes. So we believe in healing and we believe that God is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that you may ask or even think mm -hmm. according to the powers that work within us or works within you. So we are praying for you, for those that have survived, those who have come out of those. We thank God for you. God is a healer. And we pray for all of you who are going through these, these therapies right now, these chemo or radiation therapies. Keep your focus and your faith in God. He is able through the Lord Jesus Christ to heal your body. And so we stand in agreement for that. Amen. Glory be to God. And once again, I gave a shout out to the pastors in my life. I didn't want to call names because I didn't want anybody to get left out. But to all the pastors and mothers and evangelists, apostles who've been an inspiration in my life, I want to give a shout out publicly to say happy Pastors Appreciation Month. And I tell men and women of God, if you got a man or a woman of God that labors for you, you are blessed to have them. And it takes a special woman, a first lady, I give a shout out to her too, because it takes her to deal with the lot that comes upon the man of God. So if you have a pastor male or female, that's giving you the sincere word of God, that's there when you need them, that pray for you and stand in the gap, learn to appreciate the shepherd that God has put in your life to help you grow in your relationship with Christ. So I just want to give a shout out to all the pastors. Happy Pastors Appreciation Month. Thank God for a man of God preaching the bloody gospel of Jesus Christ. For without it, I wouldn't have been saved. So I thank God for all the men, that men and women of God has been an inspiration or instrument in my life. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. And I have a couple of announcements. We'll get right into it this morning. Once again, uh, for those of you that will continue to be a blessing to us financially to help support us, to help us carry out the gospel at the end of the broadcast, my wife will post those out and you will see the way that you can support us giving. I've been saying it for a while, but I'm just rather for you to read it at the end. So you will see, because we're going to do some changes with our giving, some other things that we're in work of doing right now. So, but right now, if you still have most of it on there, she would have it on at the end of the broadcast for you to be able to sow into CFMI. But if you want to be a blessing to me, and I've been a blessing to you, there's, there's three ways that you can, two ways you can be a blessing to me. One of the ways is I have cash app, that's dollar sign, Apostle 2775. And also, I have Venmo, and that is Apostle-1975. So two ways to be a blessing to support me and Consuming Fire Ministries and National Church. It's Apostle, dollar sign, Apostle-2775 for cash app. And we have uh, Apostle-1975 for Venmo. 
or if you want to uh, not even use the uh, electronic uh, apps and all of that, you can write to us at uh, 6211 Sierra Avenue, Fontana, California, 92336, PMB, hashtag 1386. Once again, that's 6211 Sierra Avenue, Fontana, California, 92336, PMB, hashtag 1386. If you're writing a check or a money order or a cashier's check, you can make it payable to CFMI. That is CFMI. Any one of those ways will help be a blessing to help us to advance and continue to enhance this gospel of Jesus Christ. And because of your love, your prayers, and your sacrifices, we are able to do what it is God has called us to do. And we thank you and we pray that when you give, we believe in Luke 6.38, that when you give, it will be given back to you. Good measures pressed down, shaken together, and running over shall men given to your bosom. Glory be to God. And also, as I've stated, um, every Thursday we're on the uh, DMV Power Gospel Radio Network. I would also be putting some more information on about that. Some interesting things are happening. But if you want to catch our broadcast, it is 11.30 a.m. every Thursday, Pacific Coast Standard Time and 2.30 Eastern um, Standard Time, uh, 11.30 for us and 2.30 on the East Coast and all the other central regions can catch it during that time, whatever your time zone is. Um, we're on every Thursday, the DMV Powered Gospel Radio Network. Um, the call in and catch us live, you can go to, you can go to, um, you, can, you can dial in area code 206-806-9770. That is area code 206 806 9770, and you can hear me teaching live. Or if you missed the live and you want to go back and catch the pre recording of what I taught, you can go to https colon backslash backslash dmv uh, dot power dot gospel radio dot airtime dot pro. DMV power gospel dot airtime dot pro. You can go ahead and catch us that way, or you can go to www.dmv power gospel radio dot net. You can go on and click onto the Fiery Furnace broadcast and let us know how it's been a blessing to you to keep us on the air, to keep the gospel around the world. Amen. Glory be to God. I am excited about the word of God. And as we prepare to teach this morning, I want to open us up with prayer. And we're going to go in and let the Holy Ghost lead us the way he wants us to go. Glory be to God. Father, in the name of Jesus, as I come humbly before your people today, I continue to decrease that you may increase. Lord, hide me behind your rugged, bloody cross. Stand your word up in me. Teach through me. Teach for me, O oh God. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord and Kingsman, Redeemer, Father, anoint these lips of clay with your anointing. And God, I pray that every word that will go through this camera today, God, will touch the ears and the hearts of your hearers, God, that they will ask, what must I do to be saved? And, oh, God, those that are saved, that it will help them grow in their relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And we bind up every demonic spirit that will try to hinder the word from going forth today. We bind up technical difficulties. We bind up doubters, God, unbelievers. Those that will come with the spirit of envy, God, will leave here, God, saved and delivered and filled with the precious Holy Spirit. And, oh, God, I ask you as I go throughout the rest of this day, I pray that you will be glorified. And we who are the sheep of your pasture, we shall continue to be edified. We ask all of this and all blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Glory be to God. I want to continue from our teaching series, The Judgment Seat of Christ. The Judgment Seat of Christ, part four. We've been dealing with the judgment seat, and by now we understand the difference between the judgment seat of Christ and the great white throne judgment. We've looked at that the judgment seat of Christ are for those believers who will be raptured when Christ comes back for his church, that when we are raptured, we're no longer the church here. We become the bride. And the first stop, once we get into the heavenlies with Christ, uh, we're to stand before what's called the Bema Seat. We discovered that the Bema Seat is an elevated platform that a judge sits on. And from that seat, he judges those based on what they have done. It was an Olympic term, we discovered, that, that used that to judge the works of the people who were in competition. So Christ will be that judge that will judge the works that we have done. Last week, we discovered the difference of how the works will be judged. If it was wood, hail, stubble, it would be burned up. 
but gold or silver, it will be purified. We talked about the works which they'll be built on Christ, who was the foundation. We discovered last week that, that, your, that the judgment seat is not to condemn you for sin. We discovered that the judgment seat there is going to be based on the works that you've done mm -hmm. once you receive the salvation that you have. And so we have to understand that just because you get saved, you're still going to have to go before the judgment seat of Christ. It's not a judgment of condemnation, but of your works. We saw the different types of works and the quality of the works. In other words, Christ's main objective is to look at the motive behind the works and how they were done. So we looked at that last week. So now this week, we're going to be dealing with uh, what will be the results of the judgment. So we're going to look at what will be the results of the judgment. So we're going to look at that. What will be the results of the judgment? And I want to, um, four, three points I want to get to today. Number one, what will be the results of the judgment? Number two, losing rewards. And number three, gaining rewards. So we're going to look at the first point we're going to look at this morning. Well, what will be the results of the judgment followed by the losing rewards? And then we're going to look at gaining rewards. And there are two crowns. There's a total of four crowns that the believer will receive at this beam of seat. But I'm only going to get the two today if I can. But I want to get us going in this direction today. Glory be to God. So like I said last week, if you have your Bibles, if you have your highlighters, your pens, I want you to take these scriptures down. I won't touch on all of them, but it's for you to go back on your own time to look at. But I will touch on a couple of them today. So real quickly, if you have your Bible, I need you to write this down. I need you to write down 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 14. 1 John chapter 2, verse 28. 1 John chapter 2, verse 28. Romans 8 and 1, Romans 8 and 1, 2 John 8, 2 John 8, 1 Corinthians 9 and 24 through 27, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 through 27, and Philippians chapter 1, verses 14 through 19. Philippians chapter 1, verses 14 through 19. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 14. But I want to go to 15. So 14 and 15 reads this from the New American Standard Bible. It reads, if any man's work which he has built on, it remains, he will receive reward. If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss. But he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. So, in other words, let's look at it again. Verse 14 says, if any man's work which he has built on, it remains, he will receive a reward. So, when you go before the Bema seat and the work that you did remains, you will be rewarded for the works that you've done. But if you go before the Bema seat and your work is burned up, based on the quality or the work that you've done. Watch this. Your work will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved. So in other words, your work will be lost, but your salvation is still intact. So basically here what Paul is saying, this judgment seat has nothing to do with your salvation because Jesus, as we've discovered, has already gained your salvation. It is the work that you've done, and I explained that last week. We're not saved by works. But we're saved unto good works, which means once you receive the salvation, you ought to be producing the works to show that you are a believer. So your works may be lost, but your salvation will still, you will still be saved. It's just that you will lose the works, which means you won't receive that crown for the works that you have done. Okay, so let's look at it here. Believers, people of God will gain or lose rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. Works enduring through the fire of God's judgment will be rewarded. So the works that, that, are, that are able to stand while God is judging their works, they will, watch this, 
they will be rewarded. 1 Corinthians 3, 14 and 15, which we just read. Works that do not survive the fire of God's judgment will lose their value. So the works that you did, if it, if it stands God's judgment, you will be rewarded for what you did. But if it does not stand God's judgment, then you will suffer loss. You will suffer loss, but your salvation will not be affected. We talked about that. Those who lost their salvation are those who have never accepted Christ as their Lord and Savior. From the time that Christ, during the tribulation, through the millennium, all the way to the end, they've rejected Christ. We know that they're not at this judgment seat. This judgment seat, we discovered, are for believers. The great white throne judgment will be for the unbelievers, okay? All right, so we see this will happen. What will be rewarded? If you, if you do what you're supposed to do, you will receive your rewards. If you don't, whatever you did not do, and, and it doesn't survive the judgment of God, you will suffer loss. Which brings us to our second point, the losing of rewards. Mm -hmm. Several scriptures indicate that rewards can be lost. John wrote about the possibility of being ashamed at the coming of Christ. Let's look at 1 John chapter 2, verse 28. Let's look at this real quick. 1 John chapter 2, verse 28. Listen to what John says, the apostle John. He says, now, little children, he says, abide in him so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink away from him in shame at his coming. So he's talking about when Christ appears, when we're doing what we're supposed to do and Christ comes, we will not be ashamed to show ourselves before him, which is Jesus Christ. Why? He says the grammar of this passage suggests that self-realizing embarrassment of shame at the appearing of the Lord rather than any uh, uh, punitive shaming from the Lord. Believers will not be condemned. Romans 8 and 1, we discovered last week where he says, therefore, there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. We will not be ashamed when Christ comes. We will be grateful when he comes. There will be no need to be ashamed because he's taken away the shame. He's taken away the guilt. He's taken away the condemnation, okay? So look at it, people of God. John also taught that the one could lose rewards for unfaithful living. One loses his rewards for unfaithful living. Not living in faith, not trusting God. Watch this. Not only not trusting Christ, but doing what Christ called you to do once you got saved. Can I just park a note right there quickly? Once you get saved, you're not just saved to be saved. I said that last week. And I need to stress that again. You are called to be a disciple to win souls, to bring souls to the kingdom of God. Not to just sit in church and do nothing. All of us are going to be held accountable for what we did or what we did not do. And I'm not just talking about last week. I didn't get into it. But everything that has to do with Christ, you will be held accountable for. It's your living as well as your giving. And everything that's involved, you will be held accountable for. So, he talks about those who have lost it for their unfaithful living. Let's look at 2 John verse 8. 2 John verse 8 says, Watch yourselves that you do not lose what we have accomplished, but that you may receive a full reward. So, so, so John is warning the church here at Ephesus, watch yourselves, watch yourselves that you do not lose what we have accomplished. In other words, what you've gained in Christ, be careful with how you use it. Watch, watch this. But that you may receive a full reward for what you have done. Watch this. He wanted his readers, people of God, to get the full reward that was available to them for their faithful service. So in other words, that when the children of God go before God himself at the Bema seat, they will be able to see the full reward for what they've done while they were here. So can I help you? When you get raptured out of here or he calls you with him and you go before the Bema seat, everything that you've done, whether it be good or bad or indifferent, will be judged. And if you've done it with a sincere motive, if you've done it with a pure heart, 
your reward will be great. But if you didn't do it with a pure heart or with the right motive, you're going to suffer loss. Mm -hmm. Your salvation is intact now because remember, this is not dealing with your salvation. This is dealing with the work or the deeds that you're doing as a believer. Because the only people that are going to be at the Bema seat are believers. Mm -hmm. Remember that. Unbelievers will not be nowhere near the Bema seat. They will be at the great white throne judgment. Okay? Glory be to God. So let's look at it. Paul also spoke of being disqualified by failing to live a faithful life. We read 1 Corinthians 9, 24 to 27. In Paul's analogy of the house that is burnt, the works are consumed, right? But, people of God, the builder escapes with his life. So, reward or loss, but the person is not. <laughs> so, at the Bema seat, the person is not lost because their salvation was something that they did not earn. Remember, salvation is a gift. You did not earn salvation. Jesus gave you salvation by losing his life. But now you are held accountable for what, what you do with that salvation or the works that you're doing once you get saved. Does that make any sense? So once you get saved, people of God, you are held accountable. And I think a lot of people think, well, I just go to church on Sunday and Wednesday and I do my due diligence. No. What else are you doing outside of that? Because he's going to look at everything that you do. So let's look at it. He says this here. Rewards are lost. Watch this. But the person is not. Believers can lose the recognition and reward that they could have received had they done their work according to God's standards. <laughs> they could have kept their rewards if they had done it according to God's standards. In other words, if they had done it God's way, they wouldn't lose their rewards. Mm. So my question is, when you're working for the Lord, are you doing it God's way or are you doing it your way? Because God has standards in which we ought to do his work. Glory be to God. Watch it. Even though, people of God, ministry done for the wrong motives may result in fortunate for, forfeit, forfeiture rather, of rewards. So, in other words, doing ministry with wrong motives may result in a forfeit of rewards. You will forfeit or give up your rewards if you're doing ministry in the wrong way. Ooh, that's enough right there for me. Because a lot of people are in ministry, but they're in ministry for the wrong motive or the wrong reason. The reason you should be in ministry is to do the works to bring God the glory for what you're doing. If you're not bringing God the glory through the motive, then why are you doing it? Mm. Glory be to God. Here it is. It may still have Eternal effects. <laughs> Watch this. Eternal effects. Philippians chapter 1 verses 14 through 19. Let's look at that real quick. 1 Corinthians. I mean, I'm sorry. Philippians rather. Philippians chapter 1. Let's look at this. Philippians chapter 1 verses 14 through 19. This is Paul talking to the church of Philippi. Listen to what he says. He says from the New American Standard Bible, he says, and that most of the brethren trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment have far more courage to speak the word, uh, to speak the word of God without fear. Verse 15. Some to be sure are preaching Christ even from envy and strife, but some also from God, from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim, proclaim Christ, rather, out of selfish ambition, rather than from pure motives, thinking to the cause, to cause me distress in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and, and in this I rejoice. Yes, I will rejoice, for I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through our prayers 
and through the, pro, the, the provision of the spirit of Christ Jesus. So what Paul is saying here, there are people preaching Christ with different motives and for different purposes. Some preach him out of envy and strife. Some preaching it because they really have a heart for it. And some are preaching because of my calamities for being imprisonment. But he said the latter who do it because they love God. So whenever you're doing works, the work should be not out of envy, not out of jealousy, not out of strife, but the work that you do for Christ should be because you love him. And that is why you are to do the work. So watch this. God's word does not return void and may have an effect in spite of the person. So in spite of the motive in which the gospel went out that Paul was telling the church of Philippians, as long as Christ was preached and they heard, remember, faith comes by hearing mm -hmm. and hearing by the word of God. So whether they heard it or not, in spite of how it was brought out, the fact remains that the word went forth and they heard it. So it had a chance to save a person so the person could be saved. So in other words, he's showing us no matter how it is, no matter what you do, if you're going to do it, make sure that you're doing it with the right motive. Because when it goes before God, Christ at the beamer seat, who will be judged, your works are going to be judged. Whether you're an apostle, prophet, evangelist, bishop, your works are going to be judged too. Based on how you did it and the motive in which you did it with. Glory be to God. So I need people to get that today. And I'll make a little side note and I'll move on to my next point. You ever notice that when people give you something, there are certain people that won't take certain things from you? Or if somebody gives you something, you'll be like, no, I'm cool. And it's not that you wouldn't take it, but you saw the motive behind which they were giving it to you. So you said, if you're going to give it to me in that way, you might as well go on and keep it. That's how God is. If you're going to do it wholeheartedly, then do it. But if you're doing it with a motive or an agenda behind it, then you might as well go on and keep it. I'd rather for you to give me something genuinely and sincerely from purity than just giving me something because you want to give it to me. Because if the truth be told, you really didn't want to do it. But you, oh God, I know I'm going to get in trouble. But you did it because that's what you chose to do. So you want to make sure that whatever you do for Christ, that your motives are genuine and sincere. You ever met people like that? I'm, I'm going to deal with this motive for just a minute. You ever met people who do stuff for you? And every time you look around, they got to bring up what they did for you. Oh, I know I'm talking. Well, remember I gave you this? And remember I, but you told me, God told you to do this for me. So if God told you to do this for me, then you did it from a God motive and not your own. So this is the same way with the works that will be tested at the Bema seat. When you witness, did you witness to say, look how many souls I brought to Christ? Did you preach to say, look how many people sitting under my ministry? Did you, did you see people get delivered and say, look how many people I delivered? Or did you do it for God to get the glory? That's the motive that Christ will judge. At the, and even when you give, well, I give tithes and offerings faithfully. If it wasn't for my tithe, there wouldn't be a church. Well, do you do it with the right motive or do you do it to glorify yourself? That's going to be judged at the Bema seat. Mm -hmm. Glory be to God. Which brings us to point three. Gaining a reward. So we talked about how the rewards will be lost. Now we're talking about how rewards will be gained. Let's look at the reward that will be gained. The distribution, people of God, of rewards will take place at the judgment. So losses and reward gains will be taking place at the judgment seat. You're going to lose some rewards and you're going to gain some rewards. Now remember... I've been saying to you, your salvation will not be lost because your salvation has already been sealed by Christ's life, death, and resurrection. But you can gain or lose your rewards what you've done after you receive this salvation, okay? So watch this. The rewards are never given to satisfy the believer's ego, <laughs> but to bring praise and glory to Christ. So the reward's not given you to say, woo -hoo, look at what I've done. Who look at me. No, it's to bring Christ's glory who you did it for. Watch this now. Who empowered the believer to serve? So it was Christ that gave you the empowerment to do the work in the first place. 
So it's not you that gets the glory. It's the one who's empowering you that belongs the glory and the honor. <laughs> Here it is. Watch this. He says, who empowered the believer to serve. Let's look at Philippians chapter 1 verse 11. Philippians chapter 1 verse 11. Watch this. This is Paul talking once again to the church of Philippi. He says, having been filled with the fruit of righteousness, which comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and the praise of God. The fruits of the fruit rather of righteousness. Righteousness, because remember, we're not righteous in and of ourselves. He makes us righteous. So it's his righteousness that causes us to live right. So we're to honor the one who gave us the righteousness, which is Jesus Christ. This is what he's saying here. Watch this. Rewards are promised for faithful service. Rewards, you will receive your rewards for faithful service. Being faithful to the Christ that you serve, you will receive your rewards. I know this ain't popular today because everybody thinks when I go to church and I love, I'm just going to go to heaven. No, there's an accountability that the believer has to have because when you go before the judgment seat, Christ is going to be there. And Christ is going to hold us accountable for everything that we did since we've been believers. Well, I just went to church. I don't know about you, but I have been through too much hell on earth <laughs> just to get up there, just to say I'm saved. Because <laughs> I could have just been acting a straight nut. But because he saved me and I'm doing the work, I want those crowns that he has stored up for us. Amen. So let's look at it. Rewards are promised for the faithful service. Good works, the fruit of righteousness, glorifying the one who graciously imputed his righteousness to believers. Christ is the one who imputed his righteousness. Remember last week, we looked at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. It says, he who knew no sin became sin. That we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Which means that God has, imp Christ imputed righteousness on us by taking our unrighteousness from us. Sin was imputed on him. And because he became sinful because of our sins, we were able to become righteous because of what Jesus did. Mm -hmm. So the only reason why we're able to be righteous is because of the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Okay? Listen to this. The New Testament mentions a series of crowns as motivations for godly behavior. So in the New Testament, there are crowns that the believers will receive at this bema seat or this judgment seat of Christ for, for watch this, for godly behavior. <laughs> not, not your behavior, godly behavior. Let's look at it. The Bible speaks of two kinds of crowns in general. One is the diadem. It's called the diadem. D-I-A-D-E-M. The diadem. The rulers wear those. Those are, are crowns that rulers, kings wear. Okay? Diadems. The other is the victory crown. So there's two crowns that the Bible speaks of. One is called the diadem. They're rulers, kings, Ambassadors wear those, the diadem, D-I-A-D-E-M, diadem, the rulers wear. The other is the victory crown. And that Greek word for victory crown is Greek word or Strong's word G4735. Whenever you hear me say G4735, that's dealing with the Greek term of that word. So it's G4735, uh, Stephanos. It's the Greek word, Stephanos, okay? It's the Greek word for victory crown. It is the Greek word, Stephanos. And Stephanos is awarded to those who achieve, who achieve great accomplishment. The Stephanos is the victory crown. Those who have achieved a great accomplishment, those that have been through but kept their faith on God, that stayed faithful to him, those are the ones who will receive the victor's crown. The ones who held in when all attacked, all hell broke loose. Everybody did what they wanted to do. They stayed faithful to the Christ that saved them. They will be overcomers, and they will be the ones to receive the victor's crown. Let's look at this, okay? 
Here it is. He says this here. The latter term is used to speak of crowns of reward that are promised to believers for successful service for the Lord. This is a, a, a crown that will be rewarded for those who gave faithful service. Those who stayed faithful to Christ in the midst of adversity. Mm -hmm. Those who have stayed faithful to Christ when everybody else turned away. Those that stayed faithful to God when they went through trial. Let me help somebody. You cannot be a believer and don't think you're going to go through anything. That's the one thing that a lot of people get twisted. And when I first got saved, I thought, oh, I gave my life to the preacher. I, all hell broke loose after that. People turned on me. I lost things. But in the midst of it all, I was able to learn how to trust in God and stay faithful to him in spite of what was happening to me. And those are the ones that's going to receive this crown of victory who hold on to Christ and stay faithful in their service to him. Watch this while they're here on earth that are still being diligent and serving him in spite of what's happening to you, you're still staying faithful to Christ. Watch it now. Here it is. Let's look at it. So he says this here. With the imagery of the winner's crown handed out in the sporting events and military ceremonies of the first century, the New Testament writers use the crowns to picture the, the, the accommodations to come to the Christians at the judgment of their works. <laughs> so in other words, it is an imagery of a leader giving out rewards to those that are in Olympics or at a military ceremony when they're getting rewarded for the works that they've done. That is a picture of Christ giving out rewards to the believers who have helped, who stayed faithful to him until the end. They will receive their rewards at the Bema seat or the judgment seat of Christ for their faithful service to him. So you're not just going to get up there. Just, you're going to get saved. You've already been saved by salvation. But it is the work and the rewards that you're going to be rewarded for for what you did or what you did not do. Whether you did it unfaithfully or whether you did it faithfully. Mm -hmm. Amen. All right. So here it is. Watch this now. So he says this here. The Christians at the judgment of their works. Athletes crown. Athletes crowns were woven vine or wreaths made of withered wild celery. As Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9 25, he said, they do it to obtain a corruptible crown. But we an incorruptible. Scripture mentions people of God. Watch this. Scripture mentions Four such crowns, but I'm going to get to only two of them today. There are four crowns. So Paul is saying the athletes in the Olympics were competing for a corruptible crown. So that crown is going to perish. But the crown that we are going to get is going to be incorruptible, which means there will be no corruption in this crown. It won't perish. It won't go away. This is an eternal crown that you and I will receive. Watch it now. He talks about the two crowns I want to deal with today. One is called the crown of life. Let's look at this. The crown of life. This is the crown awarded to those who remain faithful through trials. Look at James chapter 1 verses 2. Uh, James chapter 1 verse 2 through 3 and 12. And see Revelation chapter 2 verse 10 and 3 11. So James here is talking about, in James 1, he says, count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations or, or various temptations, knowing that the trying of your faith worketh patience. And he says, let patience have its perfect work in you. So you're going through these trials, but you're going to receive a reward for those who were faithful through their trials. Those who were able to hold on and maintain will receive their rewards for faithfulness. <laughs> See, that's the one thing that's lacking in the Christian community today is faithfulness. Mm -hmm. and, and, and if it's faithfulness, my question is, who are you faithful to? Yeah. Are you faithful to God or are you faithful to your pastor? I'm not saying not to be faithful to the apostle, whoever you sit up under, but everything you do ought to be done to the glory of God. To be faithful to God is who you're to be faithful to. Watch it. 
Believers are to joyfully receive trials as opportunities from the Lord for growth and stability. <laughs> Let me say it again. The believer, believers are to joyfully receive trials as opportunities from the Lord for growth and stability. So when you're going through people of God, you ought to receive these trials with joy, joyfully. Because these joyfully trials that you're going to are opportunities for you to grow in the Lord and be stable in him. You can't learn to trust him if you're not going through anything. <laughs> okay. That just went over your head. You'll catch that at Dunkin' Donuts in the morning. <laughs> Glory be to God. Watch it. Man. Watch it. They are also to be not only for growth and stability, they are also to be motivated by their love for the Lord. So the trials ought to motivate you to love the Lord even the more. Because if I'm going through, watch this. Now, I'm not going through because of some foolishness, Brother Emmanuel, that I've done. I'm going through it for God's sake. And I ought to love it because if God got me going through it, he don't keep me to make it through it. Watch. Israel was guilty of wrongfully responding to their wilderness trials and for getting God's powerful deliverance through their history. Psalm 78, verse 11 and 42. In other words, Israel forgot about God, Lady Fidelis, that brought them out of Egypt. Mm -hmm. The minute they got in the wilderness, they did more murmuring and complaining than they did glorifying. Because watch this, the whole time they were in the wilderness, they never got bit. They never went hungry. They never went thirsty. God was a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. God allowed them to make it through enemy territory and they never got harmed. They never went without food. But yet they murmured and complained about God. Now, first of all, you cried out for me for 430 years. And I've come through when you were in your trial, delivered you. I wiped out a whole Egyptian army for you. Opened up a Red Sea, which is humanly impossible. Allowed you to go through the Red Sea. Allowed you to live in the wilderness and took you to your promised land. And y'all still complain to me. See, their unfaithful response to the trials, people of God, caused them to doubt God's redeeming care. Mm. That caused them to doubt God. When they should have been faithful to God and believing God because he was the one that delivered them and brought them out in the first place. And because he brought them out, they should have remained faithful to him. Watch it now. Spiritual forgetfulness robs believers of their joy <laughs> and calls the sincerity of their love into question. Spiritual forgetfulness, forgetting about the Lord who delivered you. Forgetting about the one that kept you when the enemy was coming and was on your heels. Forgetting about the one that healed your body when doctors said it was impossible. Forgetting about the one who, who, who put money in your pocket when you were broke, you owed your own self some money. Helping you. That's the God that you're supposed to remember. The love and the question. Mm -hmm. so, so, so we see there is a crown of life. And that crown of life is going to be awarded to those who remain faithful. The crown of life with those who remain faithful. So in this life, you're going to go through trials, but it's how you go through them that you will receive this crown from being faithful in the midst of these trials. Amen. Which brings us to the next crown, the crown of righteousness. The crown of righteousness. This crown, the crown of righteousness, this crown is reserved for all who anxiously await the Lord's return. <laughs> In his latter years, Paul was more concerned about standing before the court of heaven than the court of Rome. <laughs> In other words, this is the one who anxiously waits to be in God's heaven. Paul said it this way. He said, rather, he said to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. If I'm here, I'll be with the Lord. If I'm there, wherever I am, he was anxious to be in the presence of the Lord. So this crown of righteousness are for those who wait to eagerly be in God's presence. Mm -hmm. And can I just park right there as I get ready to come to my close? One of the things I want to address is that I feel, Dr. Susan, 
that the church has lost its motive. We're trying to have heaven here on earth when the Bible tells us that this heaven and earth is going to pass away. I'd rather have my courtyard in heaven where I'm supposed to be with Christ because you cannot get comfortable in this place. I'd rather be with him. So when this place is wiped away, I'm in the new city. I'm in the new heaven with him as, as, one, as his bride now, no longer as the church because I've told you weeks in advance, when we get raptured, we're no longer the church. We become the bride. Christ becomes the bridegroom and we get married. So I'd rather be in that relationship eagerly waiting for the crown of righteousness, right? Watch this. In closing, Paul says this. He says, I'm ready. And Timothy, when Paul is getting ready to be beheaded, he says these words as I, as I close. I am already being poured out as a drink offering. And the time of my departure is at hand, has come. I fought the good fight. I finished the course. I've kept the faith. And in the future, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness. Can I say that as I close? Paul, as he was watching them, as he was penning his epistle, getting ready to be beheaded, Paul said, I'm already ready to pour out to be a drink offering. My time is at hand. In other words, my death is near. I fought the good fight. While I was here, I stayed faithful to Christ. I've been shipwrecked. I've been stoned. I've been beaten. I, I need to close powerfully today huh? because I need the believers to know huh, that you ain't the only one that's going through. You ain't the only one that everybody lied on. You ain't the one that everybody's going to talk about. You ain't the one, only one everybody's going to blaspheme and talk about you and say things about you. Paul said, I fought the good fight. I finished the course. I did everything that once Christ saved me, he told me to do as an apostle while I was here. He said, I've kept the faith. I didn't deviate. I kept my belief in Christ Jesus. He says, now there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness. So when you stay faithful to God and when you stay eager to seek his face and see him, you will receive the crown of faith. You will receive the crown of righteousness. You will receive those crowns of life when you stay faithful to him. And my, and my closing is, is that these are the first two crowns. I'll close out the other ones next week. But my thing is that when you go before the beam of seed, will your works be purified or will your works be lost? Your question is, when you do your works now, after you've heard these teachings over various weeks, will you do it with a sincere motive unto God? Or are you doing it for your own press relief and for your own show? My question is, my prayer is that you understand that everything you do, from your giving to your living, will be judged at the beam of seat of Christ. And it's my prayer and my heart's desire that your works will be purified and that you would gain those crowns that Christ has set up for us when we go before his beam of seat. Glory be to God. Amen. Hallelujah. If you have not, if you heard what I just said today, if you have not accepted Jesus Christ, as your Lord and personal Savior, we offer him to you today. I just want to park a note here because I want us to understand, and I know this is not popular because I, I, I watch a lot of people and people preaching on Jubilee and you, what you're going to get, my blessing, my blessing, my blessing. My question to you is when you get the blessing, who are you blessing? Hmm. That's my question because God don't bless you just to bless you. He bless you to be a blessing to others. And one of the blessings that you and I have received or can receive that no money, no gifts can ever pay for is your salvation. Jesus gave you that gift by giving his life. And I don't know who you are today. If you're watching me, wherever you may be, whether you're in a hotel, whether you're, whether you're in, a, in a prison cell, whether you're just walking the streets and you happen to turn on this broadcast, I want to lead you to the Lord today. Tomorrow's not promised. The next few seconds are not guaranteed. But now, while you have the breath in your body and you have the blood running warm through your veins, we offer Jesus Christ to you as Lord and Savior. Wherever you are and wherever you may be, just raise your hands and just begin to repeat after me the Lord's Prayer. And Father, Father I, am a sinner, I am a sinner and I need to be saved. And I need to be saved. Lord, Lord, 
After hearing, after hearing your, message, your message, I now believe, I now believe in, the life, in the life, in the death, in the, death, in the, burial, in the burial, in the resurrection, in the resurrection of, Jesus Christ. of Jesus Christ. I now believe, I now believe that you raised, that you raised Jesus, Jesus from the dead, from the dead on, the third day. on the third day. And now, and now by, faith, by faith, I submit, I submit and, I and I surrender to you. To you as Lord, as Lord and, Savior. and Savior, I ask you today, I ask you today come, into my life, come into my life, be my Savior, be my Savior and, be my Lord. and be my Lord. And I ask this, I ask this in, your son, in your Son, Jesus' name, Jesus name. Amen. amen. If you just repeated that with me, people of God, hallelujah. I want to welcome you to the family of faith, but I don't want you to stop there. The Bible says, According to Romans 10 and 9, if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised Jesus from the dead, thou shalt be saved. And he says, with the mouth one confesses, with the heart one believes unto righteousness. So if you've confessed Christ and believe, I want to welcome you to the family of faith, but I don't want you to stop there. If you're not in the ministry, I need you to find a Bible teaching, preaching ministry that believes in teaching the Bible line upon line, word upon word, precept among precept. Here a little, there a little. We need you to find a ministry that will help you grow in your relationship with God. The apostle, the apostolos, the one who governs to make sure that the church and the doctrine is sound. The prophetes, the prophet that give the, hears the voice of God and declares to God's people what God is saying. The evangelism. The one that preaches the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ to get your soul saved. The pastor, the poet, the one who, the shepherd who protects and watches over the flock. And he's also the teacher to help equip you so you can grow in a more intimate relationship with Christ. That is the ministry you need to find yourself being a part of. And don't just join. Join and be a part. Help bring souls to the kingdom of God. He never said apostles and prophets do it. He said go into all the world and make disciples of men. All of us are called to go. And I pray that you will begin to get on fire for God and do what God's called you to do. I want to welcome you to the family of salvation. If you don't have a church home, I need you to write me. 6211 Sierra Avenue, Fontana, California, 92336 PM, PMB. Hashtag 1386. Let us know that you received Christ as your Lord and personal Savior. Or you can email me at cfmi.jhines at gmail.com. And let me know that you received Christ. And we would love to send you some evangelistic material to help you grow in your relationship with Jesus. Glory be to God. I'm excited. I thank God for you. I'm out of time. But I am not out of word. I look forward to seeing you this time next week. And as I depart from this broadcast, I bless you with the priestly benediction that Moses offered up in number 6, 25 through 27. He says, may the Lord bless you and may the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord lift up his confidence upon you and may the Lord give you peace. I ask this in all blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. I love you all with the love of the Lord. Peace.